welcome to our online service. My name is Mariana and I'm here with Michael today. Yeah, it is good to be together, friends, no matter where you are, how you're engaging with this. Um, please know that you're not doing it in isolation, that we are together yeah. in this and that uh, we get to experience what God has for us in today's time together. So Yeah. And it, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we talk together. Yeah. There's so much going on here at the church. So we just want to remind you that if you go to our app under journey and events, you'll find all the things that is going on. So please check it out. And there are all sorts of other yeah. resources and things for you. So explore our app so we can yeah. stay together and connected. Absolutely. Friends, today, uh, Pastor Allen is going to be bringing another message uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we're just excited to see what God's going to do in our time together. Um, so will you join me in prayer as we just ask God to open our hearts uh, for what He has for us today? Mm -hmm. Father, we approach Your throne boldly mm -hmm. as Your daughters and sons. Um, we don't have to be shy. Uh, we don't have to be timid. Um, but we can come knowing that we're loved today. So God, no matter where we find ourselves in this place, um, would you make yourself known? Um, would you reveal your heart to us for today? And, um, and as we um, dig into your word and dig into what you have for us, God, our heart is that, um, that we would be in that continual journey of transformation, looking more like you, looking more like your son, Jesus. So we give this time to you, God. Speak to us and, mm -hmm. uh, and change our hearts in Jesus' yeah. name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Christ community. Great to be with you today. Happy Father's Day weekend to all the dads out there. Uh, shout out to my dad if he happens to be watching. He is 91, and I'm so grateful for him being my dad. I also have the... A blessing of being a dad. And so um, I'm grateful for that incredible privilege. Uh, I wanted to, before we jump into the message, I wanted to um, just mention something cool that happened last week. Uh, we as a church, we have this thing called International Training Institute, ITI, where we provide training, biblical training for leaders around the world who don't have access to that kind of training. And we just had a, a training like this in Colombia. This is the first in-person one we've been able to do for a while because of COVID. We had 85 students there, 85 people spending four days getting trained in how to study the Bible, how to, how to be better leaders, all of these things. And so I wanted to just celebrate that and uh, just kind of remind you that um, those of you who are investing financially in Christ's community, your giving, your generosity is making things like that happen. You're impacting, literally impacting people around the world and the church around the world. So way to go, Christ community. Thanks to all of you. So we as a church are going verse by verse through this amazing sermon Jesus gave in Matthew chapters five to seven. In these three chapters, Jesus gives us this powerful picture of what it looks like to follow him, of what it looks like to be people of his kingdom rather than the kingdom of this world. And what is very clear in this entire passage is that Jesus is not interested Interested in gathering a group of fans, you know, people who admire him or who believe the right things about him. He is interested in gathering a group of followers, a group of people who actually align their lives around him. They, they pattern their lives according to his values and his heartbeat. That's really what this entire Sermon on the Mount is about. It's, it's about us more and more reflecting the character and the heart of God in the way that we live our lives. So, I mean, so, so far in chapter five, we, we, we've seen Jesus urging us to be people of, of mercy and to be peacemakers and to be pure in heart. We've seen Jesus calling us to be salt and light and to be people of sexual purity and people who love our enemies and keep our word. All of these are really challenging and practical aspects of how Jesus wants us to live. Well, at the end of this section in chapter five, Jesus gives this, this very significant summary statement that honestly sounds pretty intimidating. Uh, verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. I mean, talk about a high bar. I mean, perfection. <laughs> are you kidding me? This word translated perfect here is a word that speaks of being complete. So when it's used of God, it means perfect. 
holy. But when it's used of us, a better translation is mature. God's heart is that we grow spiritually, that we become more and more mature, more and more like him. Now, when we hear that, our instinctive response is to say, okay, tell me how to do that. You know, how do I grow in maturity? And, and that's where we would expect Jesus to go next in this sermon, but he does it. What Jesus does is focus on a far more foundational question than how. Jesus focuses on the why. Why are we pursuing maturity? Why are we doing the things that Jesus calls us to do? And this is a far more foundational question. So why is this why question so important? Well, the reason is because it reveals our hearts. I remember a few years ago, someone I hadn't connected with in a while, you know, reaching out to me out of the blue um, and, and said, hey, they, they said, hey, I'd love to connect with you and catch up. And I thought that, that'd be great. Let's do it. So we set up a time, got together and and within about 10 minutes or so of, of us meeting, it became clear that, that he didn't just want to catch up. He wanted to sell me something, which is totally fine. I, 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 I know people make a living that way, and that's totally fine. I just wished he would have been honest when he initially reached out to me about his why, because then it wouldn't have felt so yucky, relationally speaking. I mean, this question of why we're doing what we're doing is critically important, especially in our relationship with God. It, it's very easy for us to get so focused on the what and the how of Christianity, you know, doing the right things. But if we miss the why, we miss everything. We miss everything, which is why Jesus in the middle of the sermon about how to live our lives according to his kingdom, he takes some time to address this right after urging us to be mature as we just saw, Jesus then gives us this very strong warning in Matthew chapter six, verse one, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. Jesus here is confronting a specific group of people, the Pharisees, who were actually very diligent about practicing righteousness. They devoted their lives to obeying God's word, to diligently following his commands. I mean, no one can fault the Pharisees for a lack of zeal in trying to obey God. They were earnestly focused on the what and the how of righteousness. But Jesus points out that their why was misplaced. They were doing all of these good things, but their motivation was not God word. Their motivation was self. Jesus says here in verse one, that the reason they were doing acts of righteousness was in order to be seen by others. They wanted other people to notice what they were doing, to see these righteous things they were involved in, that their heart motivation in practicing righteousness was to feed their need for approval for accolades. They wanted people to see and to notice how spiritual they were. And Jesus basically says, you are completely missing the point. God is not impressed by the righteous things we do. If the reason we're doing them is to look good and impress other people. Now, in order to make his point more, point more for, forcefully, Jesus then gives three specific examples of this. First had to do with giving to the poor. Verse two. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Jesus is describing a person who is doing something really good. I mean, they're, they're giving money to someone in need. But when they do this, they make sure everyone knows that they're giving to this need. I mean, the, the trumpet Jesus mentions is probably, you know, exaggerated. I mean, no one is literally blasting a trumpet, but they can easily toot their own horn. I mean, there are all sorts of ways we can make sure other people know about our generous gift. Reminds me of an old Seinfeld episode where George is trying to get on the good side of this pizzeria owner where George buys calzones for his boss, right? And so George's plan is to put in the tip jar, there's a tip jar there, is to put in the tip jar a very generous tip when the owner is looking 
to kind of get on his good side, right? But unfortunately, just as George is putting this tip in the tip jar, the owner turns away and he doesn't see it. And so then George realizes what happened. And so he reaches back in the tip jar to take it out and put it in again. But when he does this, the owner now turns and he sees him do this and he accuses him of stealing and he kicks him out of the restaurant. It was this hilarious example of someone using generosity as a way to actually fuel their own self-centeredness. But honestly, we're all vulnerable to this. I remember feeling prompted by the Lord to give a financial gift to someone that was going through a challenging time. So Raylene and I sent them this gift, um, a check with, with, with a word from the Lord that we, we felt like the Lord had given us for them. And so we typed it out and everything. And I was excited to do this and to bless them in this way. So I noticed in my bank statement that the, the check cleared almost immediately. So that was good. Um, but over the next few days, I found myself expecting a thank you note. Nothing too extravagant, but just a simple note, you know, acknowledging how meaningful my gift was to them. Well, the longer it went without hearing anything, the more frustrated, the more bothered I got. And in the midst of that, I felt like the Lord asking me one day, Alan, why did you give them that gift? Was that gift for them? Or for you? Did, did you truly want to bless them? Or did you want someone else to notice and acknowledge how generous you were? Second example Jesus gives of this is the area of prayer. Verse five, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Again, Jesus is highlighting an activity that's really good. Prayer is a good thing. As we're going to see in the next few weeks, he goes into more detail about how to pray. So the issue was not what they were doing. The issue was why they were doing it. These religious leaders love to pray standing in front of the synagogue or on street corners so that other people would see them. Again, this is about using prayer in order to impress people, wanting other people to see how spiritual we are. And, do, and in doing so, we miss the whole point of prayer. I mean, just being real here, uh, there are times when I'm, when I'm preaching and I'm feeling God's pleasure and God's anointing, and this thought will pop into my head. This is really good. This is really good. I wonder if some people are going to share this on social media. You know, I, I hate to even admit it, but often our spiritual activity can have a dark side where we're doing this good thing. But the reason we're doing this good thing is in order to feel good about ourselves or in order to, to impress other people. I remember being uh, with a pastor friend who shared about someone on their church's worship team who when she was on stage, she was fully engaged in worship and really getting into it. But whenever she wasn't on the team that weekend and she was just sitting in the congregation when the singing was going on, she wasn't engaged at all. She wasn't engaged in worship at all. And it made my friend wonder, who is she really worshiping when she's on stage? The reality is our hearts can easily get get tainted with self-centered motivations. Third example, Jesus gives, jump down to verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Notice Jesus says, when you fast, not if, Jesus expected that his followers would be involved in these activities of giving and praying and fasting. These are good things. But again, the key issue is the heart. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And in this case, Jesus describes someone who is fasting, which again is a good thing, but they want other people to know <clears throat> that they're fasting. And we all know how this works. You know, we make sure we have this miserable expression on our face the entire time we're fasting, just kind of hoping someone will ask us what's going on, or maybe we'll make some subtle comment about skipping food or whatever so that others will know how devoted and spiritual we are. 
See, in each of these examples, giving, praying, fasting, Jesus says the exact same thing. I tell you, they have received their reward in full. In other words, if we're doing these things to be seen and honored by other people, if we're doing these things to impress other people, then the only reward we will get is that very fleeting feeling when someone does notice. And for a moment, our feelings of insecurity lessen and we feel good about ourselves. That's the only reward we'll get. Now, let me point out that what Jesus is describing here goes way beyond these three particular activities of giving and fasting and praying. I mean, the reality is our culture is obsessed with image, with what other people think of us. Every selfie we take and the reason we take so many so we can choose the best one. Every one of those is, is, is to, the, the purpose of that is to put forth an image that looks really good, right? We're smiling. We're doing something fun. Our hair looks great. We look so adorable. You know, why don't we do selfies first thing when we wake up in the morning? You know, why don't we do selfies when we're fighting with our spouse or when we've had a horrible day? It's because there's a particular image we want to portray, a false self, if you will, not the real self. We don't want people to see who we really are. We only want them to see the best version of us, the, the highlight reel. But it goes beyond our appearance. I mean, where in our lives do we long for people to notice us, you know, to, to honor us for how successful or gifted we are? I mean, this is, this is honestly why so many of us pastor types are obsessed with attendance numbers or YouTube views. Even though we say it's all for God's glory, we're often trying to fill our insecurity bucket with things that make us feel more valuable. At the heart of all of this is a particular word Jesus uses in verse two, when he describes someone who gives in order to be honored by others. This word honored is the Greek word doxa, which means glory. That's the ultimate issue. Whose glory are we most interested in? Rather than living for God's glory, we subconsciously or consciously choose to find glory for ourselves, trying to prove our worth and our value by how we look or how successful we are, or the things that we, the car we drive, the phone we have, the religious things we do, or how many Instagrams followers we have. And, and here's what Jesus wants us to realize. That pursuit is a black hole. That pursuit is a black hole. The reward we temporarily experience is never enough. It's not going to satisfy and not only that, there's always someone better. There's always someone stronger, more gifted, more successful, younger, or who has a larger following on social media or whatever. So to try and build an identity on what other people think of us will cause us to miss out on the life that Jesus invites us to experience. It's amazing that Jesus' words spoken 2,000 years ago so directly speak to something we all struggle with today. Okay, so what's the answer? Well, again, this all comes back to this key question. What is our why? What's our why? In, in each of these examples, Jesus helps us see a why that is way more life-giving. Verse 3. But when you give to the needy, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jumping on to verse six. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Then finally, verse 17. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Did you notice a recurring word 
in each of those passages. The word father, it's used five times in the verses we just read. It's used 10 times in this section of scripture. It's used 17 times in this entire Sermon on the Mount. It is clear that Jesus is communicating a very important truth regarding kingdom living. And it has to do with our perception of and our experience of God. Now, we got to understand that to call God father in that time period would have been shocking to Jesus' original hearers. The religious leaders of that day would never refer to God in this personal of a way. They would never call him father. They, they referred to him as sovereign Lord or king of the universe, but not father. So Jesus is intentionally revealing not only a core truth about what God is like, but also a core truth regarding our why. What Jesus wants us to realize is that the only truly life-giving answer to our why question is ultimately a who question. Who are we allowing to determine our value? Whose opinion matters most to us? Who are we ultimately living for? If we are living for ourselves, for our own glory, then we must diligently stay on the treadmill of performance because we desperately need the approval of other people in order to feel good about ourselves. And as Jesus points out three times in this passage, if we pursue that route, the only reward we will receive is the external reward. It's the approval of people, which we all know is a very fleeting thing. People's opinions and attitudes can change in a moment's notice. The treadmill of approval seeking is not only exhausting, it also will leave us empty. It is never enough. So Jesus invites us to experience an alternative way of living. Rather than living for the accolades of other people, Jesus urges us to root our soul in a very real, very personal love relationship with God the Father. Jesus' mission on earth was to open up a pathway that enables you and me to experience God as a perfect, loving, heavenly father. This is why Jesus died on the cross. It's because of the cross of Christ that we can enter into this very personal, very real love relationship with God as father. I mean, we, we think about this. We have the joy and privilege of living our lives as beloved sons and daughters of God. This is our true identity. This is what our soul ultimately longs for, to live in a constant experience of affirmation and love from the one who created us. I mean, the reality is we all long to be seen. We long to be seen. I remember taking my son Josh swimming at the Funplex, and for two hours, all I heard was him saying, Gaga, Gaga. That's, that's dad. He calls me dad. That's how he says it. Um, dad, dad, every for, constantly for two hours. And, and when he'd say it, I'd look over at him and, and he was floating on his back or he was jumping off the edge or whatever. He, he just wanted me to see him. It wasn't about him being the best back floater or the best jumper off the edge. No, it, it was just about being seen by his dad, being delighted in. We all long for that. We all long for that. N none of us experience that perfectly from our parents or family or friends. We, we long to be seen and delighted in for who we are. And here's what's so amazing about what Jesus is saying. We have a perfect heavenly father who loves us in this way. He loves us in this way. Three times in this passage, Jesus tells us that God the Father sees us. And it is in our experience of him seeing us that our hearts can find their true worth and true value. 
It's like Jesus is inviting us to live from this place of our new identity. Rather than trying to be seen and accepted and approved in the various ways that the world pursues that, Jesus invites us to experience and cultivate a relationship with God in which we are seen by him. And we keep running back to his embrace, to his love. By doing so, we more and more live out of our true identity rather than the false one that we are so desperately trying to maintain. So what does this look like in real life? Let me at least share a personal example, recent personal example. So a couple months ago, I had worked really hard on a sermon um, because the topic was so sensitive and delicate. And I'd gotten feedback from people. and I'd revised the sermon multiple times. I'd stayed up late early in the week, Monday night late, and then Tuesday night late just to get this message ready. I probably spent twice as many hours in this message as I usually do. So I had given it my all, and then I delivered the message over the weekend. So on the Monday after I had preached this message, I was in a meeting where a few staff people were debriefing the service and talking about how it went, the various details. And, and we talked about various elements of the weekend, but, but no one said anything about my sermon. And afterwards, my heart, honestly, it, just, it felt hurt. But then I felt guilty because I'm not doing this for the approval of others. I don't want that to be my motivation. So I kind of felt guilty for feeling the way I did. Okay, so, so what did I do? I got alone with God. I got alone with God and I opened my heart to be seen by him as my father. In fact, I envisioned my, in prayer, I envisioned myself in the story of the prodigal son. And I just envisioned the father, just let the father see me and wrap his arms of love around me. And in that place, in that experience, I was reminded afresh of my why. I was reminded afresh of my true identity and the privilege it is to serve him, to give to him, to offer my gifts to him, not for anyone else's approval, but just for him. See, I, I want to live more and more out of that identity. And I know that you do too. Rather than us chasing the approval of others, and all that, I want to I live more and more out of that identity. And I know you do as well. This is the life Jesus invites us to live. To know that we are seen by him. Even when the things we do for him are not noticed, are not in the limelight. They receive no applause as we care for an aging parent or a special needs child as we fold the laundry for the 16th time this week, as we give a sacrificial financial gift that no one knows about, as we at work treat with kindness the person who is shouting at us on the phone, in the midst of those things that no one else sees, deep within we can know that our Heavenly Father sees us and that he delights in us. He values what we're doing. And as Jesus says multiple times in this passage, he rewards us. Verse four, and it's mentioned a couple of the times, then your father who sees what you do in secret, he sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. Now, we don't know the specifics of the reward Jesus is talking about. We, we typically think of heavenly rewards, which could very well be the case. But I wonder, too, if part of the reward is experienced right now, is experienced in this life, in our current situation. What if the reward is him? What if he is the reward? What if the reward we experience is a deepening love for God because we're serving him and a deepening experience of his delight and his love for us? What if the reward is an inner peace and a, a deepening contentment and a, and, a, and a significant joy that comes from just stepping off the approval treadmill 
and finding our delight in our father. I mean, what an amazingly freeing way to live, to be so secure in our father's love that we don't need the approval of others. We don't need to be noticed by others. We are freed to pray, to serve, to give in response to his amazing love for us. As I was working on this message, I had a memory come to my mind. I was like 10 years old and my dad was teaching me how to mow the lawn. And he had shown me how to keep that left wheel, you know, right on that, that tire track so you don't miss any grass. And so there I was, I was proudly doing this very adult thing, you know, mowing the lawn with a very real, you know, gas engine motor going, diligently keeping that wheel on track. My dad's right there, you know, watching. Well, well as I was nearing the end, there was this last bit of unmowed lawn that I was so sure I could get with one pass. So I tried my best, but I ended up splitting it right down the middle, leaving unmowed grass on both sides of my mower. And when I realized my mistake, the mistake I had made, I instinctively looked over at my dad and he had this huge smile on his face. He wasn't pointing out my error lecturing me about the correct way to do it. No, he, he saw my mistake and he just smiled. What, what, what I saw and felt in that smile was delight and affirmation. I wasn't afraid of messing up. I knew my dad loved me no matter what. And that gave me the freedom to grow and learn and gain confidence in who I was and whose I was. Your heavenly father loves you and sees you and delights in you. Live in the reality of his love and let that love be your why. Let's pray together. So as we are quieting our heart, I want to just offer a couple of responses to you who are watching. First of all, there may be some of you here, some of you watching, and you, you don't really know what it means to be in a relationship with God as his beloved son or daughter, to be able to call him father. Jesus is the one who makes that possible. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for our sins so that we could be forgiven and so that we could be adopted into God's family. And there are some of you and you know in your heart, you want that. You want a love relationship with God, not one you have to try to perform and jump through hoops to try to get him to love you. That's, that's not Christianity. That's religion. Jesus offers you a relationship with God where you don't have to jump through all these hoops to earn his approval. You already have it in Christ. And so I want to lead you in a prayer. If you've never done this, or maybe you're not certain, I want to lead you in a prayer where you can place your faith in Jesus as your savior, and you can enter into this relationship with God as your heavenly father. So pray with me in the silence of your heart. Dear God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And I choose to place my trust in you, Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your life. I receive you, the very presence of your spirit coming to live in me. Change me from the inside out through the power of your love. Thank you for adopting me into your family forever. So, Father, I pray for anyone who prayed that prayer. I pray they would grow in this amazing relationship with you, this new identity that is theirs. Now, for the the others of us watching, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And here's the question. I want to, as you're quieting your heart, I want you to ask the Lord this question. What's my why? What is my why? 
Are there things that I'm doing in my life for my glory rather than yours, Lord? Just ask the Lord that. Are there things you're doing for your glory rather than his? And if the Lord brings something to mind, I encourage you, just hand that to him. Just repent, admit it. God, I'm sorry. Just tell him I'm sorry. I repent of my seeking glory and being overly concerned about impressing people, oh, whatever it is, just confess that, hand it over to him. And now I want you just to receive and rest in the love of your heavenly father. Imagine him. Imagine him seeing you. Like in the story of the prodigal son, just imagine him running to you and seeing you and wrapping his arms of love around you. Friends, this is your true identity. Just enjoy his embrace. Enjoy his love for you. So, Father, I pray for all of my friends watching. And I pray this for myself, too, that we would more and more live out of our true identity of beloved sons and daughters of yours. That we would live out of that and it would free us to serve and to give and to pray and to do good things, not to impress other people or needing affirmation, but simply because we love you so much and are so grateful for your love for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm, that was so good. Yeah. I feel like this is the kind of message that I need to listen to again every day, like that reminder. Absolutely. Because I feel like, you know, we calibrate our heart, we check our heart, yeah. but then there's this magnet pulling us back. Yeah. Or if, I can speak for myself. For me, I feel this pull and it, yeah. it, you know, to like try to get the approval of people or, you know, what yeah. are people thinking? And like, no, let me find my why again. Let me turn yeah. back to, you know, finding Absolutely. my my yeah. affirmation and my identity yeah. in the Father. I think I need this on repeat Absolutely. every day. Yeah. And I think one thing that we need to realize in that is like when we realize those things that we're, we're off or we're looking to other people for affirmation, um, not to be so hard on ourselves, right? Like, cause one of the things, I was talking to Alan about this, one of the things is that like we have to realize is that we were created with a desire to be seen. Right, mm -hmm. like that's in our very nature. That's in our. That's something God gave to us, right? Right. So when we're not intentional about finding that in the the Father's in the right person, right? Exactly. Yes. In who He is, it's it's kind of human for us to go to other places, right? Right. Um, but I think you're right in the. It has to be a not just daily thing, like a moment by moment of yeah. reminding ourselves. Yeah. Um, to, to be in that place. Mariana, what does that look like for you? Like that, um, the idea of centering yourselves and coming back to the Father and like, is that, a, is that a conversation you have? Is it a prayer thing or is it a meditation? Yeah. What does that look like for you? Even what we just did with Alan here, just yeah. just sitting in the presence of the Father yeah. and, re and having that connection yeah. and that, um, yeah. Yeah, it just exper being in His presence is where we find that all those longings yeah fulfilled yeah that you, you don't elsewhere um yeah 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 i mean like for me it is it is found so often in pulling myself out of the norm you know mm. and like going for a walk even around the neighborhood or especially in the mountains or in nature for me that's just like oh that's it's it's a reminder to me of like okay I remember what all this is about. Like I remember where I received my affirmation and mm -hmm. and who whose I am. You That's know? really good. 
Um, but yeah. friends, I don't know how you're, how you're processing through this, uh, but I encourage you guys to continue this process. And yeah. Continue asking these questions and seeing what God might have for you. Yeah, in this. continuing to pursue that, that why behind, yeah. and asking that why behind. So. Yeah. Uh, we do want to dismiss you with a blessing, but before I do so, I just want to remind you again that uh, if you feel led to invest in the work of God here at Christ Community, you can do so online uh, under this video and on our app. There are very easy ways for you to give and invest in what God's doing here at the yeah. church. And also, we would love to pray for you. And you can also submit your prayer requests under this video and on the app. Um, you're not alone and we want to yeah. pray for you whatever is going on whatever in your heart is yeah. in your heart so please share that yeah friends i want to leave you with a blessing now so receive this today <sighs> friend may you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a daughter and you are a son of the living god may you know that you are highly favored that you are loved that god takes great joy and being with you. And may you know that even when you find yourselves looking to others or other things, uh, promotions or whatever it may be for affirmation, may you know that your Father is affirming you and saying, you are mine. May you be blessed in your coming in and your going out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. See you next time. <laughs>